exist to see God glorified and disciples multiplied through the power of the gospel. When I say our God is, I want you to say incomprehensible. Our God is incomprehensible. If you've ever served as a children's Sunday school teacher or a VBS worker, then you know that often the smallest children have the biggest questions. One time a Sunday school teacher was teaching her students that God created everything. And so she took her class outside to show them all that God had made. And as she was teaching, one young boy raised his hand and asked the teacher, teacher, if God made everything, then who made God? The teacher was caught off guard, so she paused, she thought, and after a moment said, well, no one. God has always existed. No one made God. And the boy just sat there in shock, and he was scratching his head. And so the teacher tried to reassure him. She said, I know it's hard for you to understand, and it will get easier when you get older. But God is so much bigger than us and so much greater that there are some things we'll never be able to fully understand. And then she pointed to an ant that was walking along the sidewalk. And she said, do you see that ant? Let me ask you, how would you explain to that ant how computers work? The boy stopped, thought about it for a moment, and then declared with pride, easy. I just have to become an ant. A lot of people have this idea of God that he's just like us, except bigger. He's the man upstairs. But I'm here to tell you that the difference between you and God is infinitely bigger between you and an ant. Even if you were told everything there is to know about God, your mind would not be physically capable of comprehending it. Or in other words, we worship an incomprehensible God. Not that our God is illogical to believe in. Not that it doesn't make sense to believe in God, but that the difference between creature and creator is so great that it's impossible for us to understand everything there is to understand about God. In fact, it's impossible for us to understand anything about God unless God, in his kindness, stoops down to us and reveals himself to us in a language we can understand. Everything you know about God, you know because God has, like a parent bending down to explain something to their child, has revealed it to you. Today in the church, there's a lot of debate within Christians on whether or not God still speaks. And if he does speak, how does he speak? Well, let me tell you this morning that God absolutely still speaks to his people And if you turn to Psalm chapter 19, we're going to find two glorious ways that God speaks. Psalm chapter 19. If you have a pew Bible, it's on page 538. And while you're turning, let me tell you three questions you need to ask every time that you read the Psalms. Every time you study the Psalms, you need to first ask, how would the original audience have sung this? The book of Psalms was literally the Israelites' hymn book, and these verses were meant to be sung by the people. So we have to ask, how did the Israelites understand what they were singing? The second question we need to ask ourselves is, how would Jesus have sung this? When Jesus walked the earth, George Beverly Shea had yet failed to put out an album. His hymnal was still the Psalms, And it's more than likely that Jesus would have sung Psalm 19 while he walked the earth. So how would Jesus have sung this? And the last question we should ask for ourselves is how are we to sing this? Both in Ephesians and in Colossians, Paul commands the church to sing the Psalms. So as Christians now, on the other side of the cross, with a fuller understanding than the Israelites had, how are we to sing Psalm 19? And be thinking about those questions as we work through this passage because this is a glorious passage to ask those questions of. C.S. Lewis said of Psalm 19, I take this to be the greatest poem in the Psalter and one of the greatest lyrics in the world. I'm tempted to agree with Mr. Lewis. 
And my prayer for us this morning is that Psalm 19 would lead us to see God's revelation as more precious than gold. Because if we study Psalm 19 this morning, we're going to find two ways God speaks to us. First, in verses 1 through 6, God speaks to us through his creation. And second, in verses 7 through 14, God speaks to us through his word. God speaks to us through his creation and God speaks to us through his word. So let's pray and then we'll read the greatest poem of the Psalter. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer, this morning may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. As we seek to hear a word from you, open our hearts to receive it. And by the power of your spirit, may the sermon that is heard be far more effective than the one that is preached. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Psalm chapter 19, verses 1 through 6 to start. To the choir master, a psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words, whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom, leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the ends of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat." In these first six verses, we see very clearly what theologians call natural revelation. Natural revelation means simply that God reveals himself through nature, through his creation. David, before he was king, was a shepherd and had countless hours to look up at the sky and to examine the heavens. And he tells us in these verses what he got out of that experience. David tells us the heavens are preaching a sermon, a sermon with one single solitary message. God is glorious and worthy of your worship. What does, uh, what does it mean that the heavens declare the glory of God? It means that every moment of every day that the sky hangs above our heads, God is shouting at us. He shouts with the stars and the moon He shouts with the planets in our solar system and the galaxies trillions of light years away from us. He shouts with every sunrise and sunset and he is shouting, I am glorious. I am like all of this, only better. And in verse two, David writes, day to day pours out speech. That word pours in verse two, it's this image of a gushing River. That's how the Bible most often uses this word pours, is with an overflowing river. God's message in creation isn't a small trickle, but a loud gushing waterfall. And it's a message that never stops even for a moment. Day after day, night after night. And then in verse 4, he tells us that though there is no audible message... Though there is no speech, no words, no voice, everyone in every tribe, in every nation, in every language can hear creation's sermon. This is the one language that was not lost at Babel. This is the one language everyone understands, yet no one hears. And all of creation is calling all creatures of our God and King to worship him. And not just a God, but all of creation is calling us to worship the true God. Why do I say that? In David's day, the prophets of other religions nearby also wrote poems and psalms in worship of their gods. And it seems like in verses 4 through 6, most scholars say that David is actually quoting from pagan poetry that was originally written in worship of the sun. He's quoting from a common image of the sun coming out of the tent that was common both in Egypt and in Babylon that was used to worship the sun. 
Why, and I know what you're thinking. Why on earth would David quote from a pagan poem about worshiping the sun? Well, it's not because he's plagiarizing it. And it's definitely not because he's pro-sun worship. What is David doing? He's taking this pagan poem and he's fixing their terrible theology. David is not worshiping the sun. Look back at verse 4. Who sets up the tent for the sun in verse 4? God does. The Egyptians and Babylonians would have pointed to the sun and said, that's our God. But then David comes out with Psalm 19 and says, no, that's not God. The the, the sun is merely God's instrument that he uses to show off his glory. The sun is lesser than my God. The sun, like a groom on his wedding day, emerges from the horizon and shows off God's glory. The sun, like a well-trained runner, joyfully runs where God has told it to run. And so with every rotation of the earth and with every sunrise and with every sunset, the voice of God goes out to the ends of the world. Every place on the planet that feels the warmth of the sun hears this groom's sermon. And I know we're tempted to think, well, I don't feel the sun's warmth right now. I looked it up on Pluto. The temperature right now is negative 900 degrees. So count your blessings for the warmth you do feel from the sun. (laughs) When we ask the question, how would the Israelites have sung this? We answer that the Israelites would have sung this with a knowledge that they worship the almighty God who made all things. The other nations worship the sun and the moon and the stars individually, but our God made those things and is in control of them. And then we ask, how would Jesus have sung these first six verses? Well, Jesus would have sung this as the one who, in verse 4, has set up a tent for the sun. Jesus would have sung this knowing that the heavens declare his glory. As we read earlier, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all things were made through Him. And now we ask, how should we sing this song as Christians? Well, now we sing this song knowing that all of creation is declaring the glory of the triune God. That in in the beginning, the Father spoke the world into existence. That Jesus is the word of his power and the spirit hovered above the waters at the beginning. And the heavens are telling of their glory. I think we also sing these verses with new confidence that we can look at creation knowing we have concrete evidence that God is real and has revealed himself to us. When I look at a painting, the painting testifies to the existence of the painter. When I look at a building, the building testifies to the existence of a builder. When I see any human being, they themselves are evidence of a father and a mother. Even if I never see the painter, the builder, the mother, or the father. I know they exist because their work testifies to their existence. And in the same way, creation loudly and boldly and constantly testifies that there is a creator and he's worthy of our worship. That's why we read earlier in Romans 1 that God's invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that all of mankind is without excuse. Now, you may be wondering, if that's really true, then why do we have atheists? Why are there atheists in the world? Well, Romans 1 goes on to tell us that it's because they suppress the truth and unrighteousness. I'd be very surprised, looking around at this room, if we had any atheists in here. But if we did have an atheist in here, I'd be so, so happy Atheists are more than welcome here, and if you know any atheists, I challenge you to talk with them about Jesus and invite them to church. But if, by chance, you're here this morning and you're an atheist, let me ask you one question. If I gave you all the evidence you needed to satisfy all your questions, all your doubts about Christianity, would you get on your knees and worship Jesus? If your answer is anything but yes, 
you're never going to run out of excuses. If your answer is anything but yes, your problem isn't a lack of evidence, but a lack of will. The only way you'll find answers is if you're willing to find the answers, even if you don't like the answers. God is speaking to us every moment of every hour of every day. The only question is, how will we respond? That's the first way God speaks to us is through his creation. But he also speaks to us through his word. Look with me to verses seven through nine. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Let's stop there. In verse 7, David switches from the big book of creation to the little book of God's word. David switches from natural revelation to what theologians now call special revelation. Or natural revelation is when God reveals himself in nature, but special revelation is when God reveals himself through his word, whether by speaking with Adam and Eve in the garden or by giving Joseph a dream, whether by speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai or by inspiring Moses to write Genesis. Anytime God intervenes and comes into human history and speaks to people in a special way, that's called special revelation. And all of creation is preaching a sermon, and it's a glorious sermon, but it's a very simple sermon. The sermon the universe is preaching can only tell you so much. The sermon the heavens are declaring only tells you that there is a God, he is powerful, and he's worthy of your worship. Which is why God hasn't just spoken through his creation, but he's also specially revealed himself through his word. Look back to verse 1. And you see in verse 1, David says, the heavens declare the glory of God. G-O-D. But now in verse 7, David uses the title LORD in all caps. And you need to know that anytime you see the word LORD in all caps, that's actually the covenant name of God. It's Yahweh. The Israelites were so careful not to take the Lord's name in vain that they would often substitute the name Yahweh for the title LORD. And that tradition has carried over into our English translations. But I think David is telling us that through natural revelation, we learn there is a God. But through special revelation, we learn who this God is. And you may have noticed a pattern in verses 7 through 9. In verses 7 through 9, you have six lines with three parts each. In each line, you'll see a title for God's word. You'll see a description of God's word. And you'll see the result of God's word. So you'll see six titles that all mean God's words. His law, testimony, precepts, commandment, fear, and rules. And then we see six descriptions for God's word. God's word is perfect, sure, right, pure, clean, true. This is the height of Hebrew poetry. This repetition hits like a chorus. You sing again and again and again, making the same point over and over again in slightly different ways. The only real difference we see in this list is in the results. So for instance, verse 7, we see that God's word revives the soul. How does it do that? Well, I think primarily the word of God confronts us, convicts us of our sin, exposes us of our sin, and gives us an awareness of our sinfulness. So many of us lived our lives blissfully unaware of how wicked we were until the law of the Lord revived our souls. I still remember I was a sixth grader at Our Lady of Fatima Catholic School and I was sitting in religion class, and, and I was a goody two-shoes. I, I thought I was a good Christian kid. I thought I deserved to go to heaven, if anyone. I was on the fast track there. But one day, my religion teacher told us, thou shalt honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. And as she explained what that meant, my heart sank. Because I realized for the first time in my life 
that I was a sinner in need of a Savior because the law had revived my soul in that moment. And that's the power of God's word. The worst place you can be is not scared, is not afraid of your sin, is not feeling the weight. The worst place you can be is indifferent to your sin. And you might have walked in here and thought, I'm a good person. I'm going to heaven. But let me ask you from God's law, have you ever told a lie? Because the ninth commandment says, thou shalt not lie. How many lies have you ever told? Hundreds? Thousands? Can you even count them? I can't. The 10th commandment says, thou shalt not covet. Have you ever been jealous of what others have? My story was about breaking the fourth commandment. So let me ask you, have you ever skipped church? Not because of a flat tire or a global pandemic or because you were sick, but because you wanted to do what you wanted to do more than worship God the way he commands you to. Why am I bringing this guilt trip on everybody? Because I want your souls to be revived. More than anything else in the world, you need to realize that you have rebelled against God's holy and perfect law. Each one of us has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And that's awful news because God is good and he will punish all those who rebel against him. But the gospel news, the good news is this. Jesus Christ has kept the law in all the ways that you and I have not. Jesus was the perfect word from heaven who came and obeyed God's word so perfectly that he could become the sinless, spotless lamb of God to be nailed to that cross for sinners like you and I. And so today, if you feel the word of God stirring in your heart, if you feel aware of your sin for the first time and feel guilty and scared about your eternity, turn from your sin and put your faith alone in the perfect sacrifice of Jesus. That's the news that makes special revelation so special. We see God's grandness and glory in creation, but we see his love and his grace in his word as well. And I'll just say real quick, this isn't in my notes. But there's a temptation for Christians as we share the gospel to skip over the sin part and just go over to God's love part. But it's actually the sin part that that makes us alive to our need to God's love, to, to revive our souls for the need for God's mercy and grace. So so let me tell you two things. First off, do not skip the sin part. Do not fear being judgmental. Fear not reviving their souls through the word of God. And and I know eternity is fleeting. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not planning to go anywhere. But if I die tomorrow and you have to start a pastoral search committee, don't you dare bring a preacher in here who doesn't preach on sin. Don't you dare bring a preacher into this pulpit who does not honor God's word and talk about the things that make us uncomfortable because the Lord uses his word powerfully to revive the souls of people. It's the power of his word. Now back to verse seven. And the second part of verse seven, we read that God's word makes the simple wise. Before the Protestant Reformation, Bibles were literally chained to the pulpit. And men were burned at the stake for the crime of translating those Bibles which were in Latin into the modern language because the church believed at the time that only church leaders should be able to read and interpret the word of God, that it's too dangerous for the common people. They're right in a sense. But the Bible is not a book for professional Christians. It's a book for even the simple In the words of St. Jerome, the scriptures are shallow enough for a babe to come and drink without fear of drowning and deep enough for a theologian to swim in without ever fear of touching the bottom. In verse 8, we see that God's word rejoices the heart. I've heard people say all the time, God cares about your holiness, not your happiness. And that is just so off the mark. If you separate holiness from happiness you're going to get both wrong. Holiness is actually being so happy in God that sin loses its appeal. And that's what we see in verse eight. Then in the second half of verse eight, the word of God enlightens the eyes. 
The Bible is a supernatural book. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul tells us that this book was written by the Holy Spirit. This is not a natural, everyday work. It, it, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, the natural man cannot understand the things of God. The natural man cannot understand the contents of this book. What we're doing right now in this room, all of you sitting here listening to me, what we're doing is supernatural because every Christian in this room who is listening to the word of God preached and who understands what is being said is only doing so by the power and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. This is a supernatural book and it can only be understood supernaturally. And, and the craziest thing about this book, the glorious news of this book is that it is so supernatural, so powerful that as we read it, as it is being preached, that it miraculously gives light to the eyes. That's why Romans 10 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ because the word gives light to the eyes. Verse nine, the word of God endures forever. I know it says the fear of the Lord, but the fear of the Lord is synonymous with the word of the Lord because a healthy fear of the Lord is a direct result of understanding the word of the Lord. The word of God should invoke a fear within you because God is holy and you are not. And now even as a believer, not a cowering fear, but an awe and respect for who God is and his power. But the point of verse 9 is that the word of God never changes. Here in America, the highest law of the land is our constitution. The men who wrote it were, were geniuses, and our constitution has served us well for over 200 years. But even our founders knew that we would need to amend and change the constitution as time went on to deal with its faults. But let me tell you something, church. The word of God needs no amendments. There is no court high enough that can overturn God's judgment because the fear of the Lord endures forever. That's why we as a church have a high view of the Bible. We believe the Bible to be the inspired, authoritative word of God without fault or error. That's why here at Horican Baptist Church, we practice what's called expositional preaching. Expositional preaching means that the point of the sermon is not determined by what I want to say, but by what the Bible wants to say. The goal in expositional preaching is simply to expose the meaning of the word of God. So that when you show up on Sunday morning, you should not, to ex you should not expect to hear my wisdom or my good ideas. I can promise you I have little of both. But when you show up, if I do my job right, you should hear from God. Not to say that preaching on topics is bad. I actually have a topical sermon series planned for a few months from now. But the reason we value expositional preaching at this church is because the foundation for everything we do at this church is the word of God. So on Sunday mornings, we don't want to hear man's wisdom. We want to hear God's word preached. God wrote a book, a perfect book, a book without errors, a book needing no revisions, a book that is trustworthy, sure, right, pure, clean, and true. And that's why David goes on in verse 10 and says what he says. Look with me. He says, more to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. In David's day, the two rarest commodities were gold and honey. And so he tells us that God's word is more to be desired than either. Let me ask you, do you believe the word of God is to be desired more than gold? Do you believe the Bible is truly sweeter than honey? And now let me ask you, how was your Bible reading this past week? When you got up to read the word, if you did do that, was it, oh, this is so sweet. This is going to energize me for my whole day. Or was the attitude, oh, another thing I need to check off the list. 
Oh, that we would have the heart of David for God's word here in Psalm 19. How incredibly different would this church be if we really believed that this book was more valuable than gold? How mightily would the Lord use the saints of this people if we would desire his word like the drippings of honeycomb? And then in verse 11, we get the last result of God's word. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and keeping them there is great reward. In the words of John Bunyan, this book will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from this book. The word of God is what warns us, like a bright lighthouse on a dark and stormy night. Now we can still choose to ignore that light and run our ship straight to the ground. And more often than we like to admit, that's what we do. But the word of God is a powerful warning against sin. And notice that at the end of verse 11, it doesn't say, by keeping them, you will then have a great reward. No, no, no. What does it say? It says, in keeping them, there is great reward. Verse 11 isn't talking about some kind of earthly financial blessing or even some kind of heavenly reward. Verse 11 tells us that there is reward and blessing in the simple act of obeying God's word. But now we're faced with a simple question. What do we do when we fail to heed the warnings? What do we do when we run our ship aground and we utterly fail? We'll keep reading in verses 12 and 13. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. The clearer our view of God's word, the clearer our view of of our own sin. As David meditates on scripture, his heart is pierced to the core. David started by looking up to the glory of the heavens, and then he looked down at the glory of the scriptures, and then he looked inward, and all he saw was his own sin. The problem David has is that he realized he doesn't even have the ability to know all that he's done wrong. Like that simple breaking of the fourth commandment for me, I was like, oh, I'm a sinner. I'm a Sabbath breaker. And as I became a Christian, I realized the problems were so much worse and deeper than that. And as we grow and mature, we learn sins that I didn't even know that was a sin. And now I realize I do it all the time. And so David, what is, what is he saying? When he says, who can discern his errors? He's saying, no one can know all the things he's done wrong. When he says, declare me innocent from hidden faults, he's saying, Lord, forgive the sins I didn't even know I had committed. And David doesn't just ask for the grace of forgiveness. He also asks for the grace to keep the Lord's commands in the future. He's saying, Lord, I've sinned so much I can't even name them all, so please forgive me. But now also give me the power to keep your commands. And then in verse 14, he ends the psalm with a prayer of meditation over everything he's written. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. How could someone like David have any hope that the Lord would forgive him? David was a man after God's own heart, but he did some incredibly wicked things. How can an adulterer and a murderer be declared innocent? And I think the key is in the last word of this song. The Lord was David's redeemer. That David did not have a full understanding of everything Christ would do, but he did know that the Lord was merciful and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. David did know that God had promised a Messiah to come who would die for the sins of Israel, a suffering servant who would come to redeem his people from their sins. And now, in the same way, we look back 2,000 years ago to the event of the cross. David was looking forward to the coming promise of the cross. And he was forgiven by his rock and his redeemer. My prayer for us this morning is that Psalm 19 would lead us to see God's revelation as more precious than gold. Because as we studied Psalm 19 this morning, we found two ways God speaks to us. Through his creation and through 
his word. So let me ask you, do you value the word of God the way David does? Do you treasure it above all? Is the word of God your anchor in life? Are you so amazed by the wonders in it that you are just overflowing with excitement to share it with others? Well, I have two pastoral charges for you. I have two ways that we can see God's revelation as more precious than gold. First, embrace God's word, especially the parts you don't like. Embrace God's words, especially the parts you don't like. If you don't have a regular time where you sit down and read the Bible, start doing it today. You don't need to read for an hour. Just read a chapter. Don't just read a Christian book. Don't just read a Christian devotional. Those things can be wonderful and helpful. But the word of God is where the power of our faith is. That's how the spirit uses or that's the most common tool the spirit will use in your life. If you don't know where to start, just do a chapter a day in the Gospel of John. But please make a time for daily Bible reading in your walk. And when you encounter parts of the Bible you don't like, trust the word, uh, trust that the Lord knows what he's doing. His word is true and his ways are higher than your ways. As Christians, we need to go to the word of God with a heart of humility and say, Lord, you are God and I am not. Lord, reveal to me my hidden faults. Lord, show me all the ways my thinking is ungodly. Those are dangerous prayers, but they're glorious prayers. As a church, we need to constantly be asking the question, what does the Bible say rather than what do we think is right? We need to move on from the mindset that we've always done it that way to what does God's word say? The Bible needs to be the source for how we live, for what we believe, and especially for how this church should operate. And finally, trust in the word that revives the soul. Trust in the word that revives the soul. Today, if you felt guilt and shame for your sin, if you felt your heart wake up from the sins you committed, then trust alone in the person and work of Jesus. He lived the perfect life died the perfect death so sinners like David and you and I could be counted as blameless in his sight. Repent of your sin and put your faith alone in Jesus so the Lord may be your rock and your redeemer. And on that note, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you are the God who is incomprehensible. That you have bent down like a father to a son and explained us glorious things. And the greatest gift of all is that you, like a man becoming an aunt, have sent your son who became a man and preached to us and died for us. May we never neglect his word and his sacrifice. And may his spirit always dwell within us and give light to our eyes. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, Taylor Callen, pastor of Oregon Baptist Church. Thank you so much for listening to this sermon. I pray that you are more encouraged and love Jesus and the gospel more after hearing the sermon than when you first sat down to listen to it. Know that that our heart at this church is that this sermon would be an encouragement to you and would be a useful resource, but would in no way replace the pastor that God has called to shepherd you or the church that you're called to be a member of. With that being said, If you want more information about our church or want to hear more sermons, go to horicanbaptist.com.